Good morning. Today's first reading is taken from the book of James, uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. Listening and doing. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The second reading today is from uh, continuing with Matthew chapter 7. And I've got to find it a second. Ah, starting at verse 21. True and false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. Shall we pray? Holy Spirit, would you be present uh, in us and amongst us and between us this morning? Would you speak to in each one of us at our point of need, challenging and encouraging us to move deeper into our relationship with you? In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning is the last in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We started in January and we've now covered all three um, chapters in full and they summarize the teaching of Jesus um, and you can also go on to YouTube and see uh, many of the other sermons. Jesus talks about forgiveness and money and possessions, sex, marriage, our inner life. There's no subject left unturned, and it's pretty challenging stuff. The last section is equally as challenging. So let me ask you a question. When did you last obey somebody or someone or submit to another person? And how does it feel when I use the word obey? Do you bristle a bit? Does it put your back up? Obviously, to obey, to obey means to, to do what has, uh, you've been asked to do. And it's kind of a hard word to swallow. It's unpleasant these days. It implies authority. And people don't like the idea of blindly just following somebody in authority without thinking for themselves. We don't like being told what to do. Uh, we want to be our own person. We want to call the shots. Uh, we want to function independently. And if we've had bad experiences of either parents or people in authority being abusive or controlling, then we fear trusting people and find the idea of obedience really scary. And in the context of religion and faith, obedience is quite an unpalatable word. It's quite interesting. There are a range of 
options for spirituality these days. Um, a lot of uh, new age ideas involving enriching our lives and connecting with a divine force. People are interested in meditation and uh, they might describe themselves as being spiritual. Buddhism, for example, is about personal spiritual development and deepening our own insight. But what's different about all of these ideas and the teachings of Jesus is that they don't require you to obey. They don't require you to change your life in any way at all. It's like a kind of pick and mix sweet shop of really good or nice ideas that you can take or leave. The thing is that Jesus says, which stands in stark kind of contrast, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He says, why do you call me Lord, but not do what I say? He says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and then do what it says. It's a kind of a, a radical and quite countercultural laying down of our rights. Discipleship is about following Jesus and giving our life to him. And in the context of faith, a Christian is someone who gives their total allegiance to Jesus as Lord, which means that he sets the terms and we follow him. It's about a surrender and a submission to doing things his way. Now let's just check in for a moment and just see and register within ourselves, how does that make you feel? How do we feel about that idea? Many people want Jesus as savior. They want Jesus as a friend and a companion, but they don't want Jesus as Lord. They want to be saved. They want benefits of faith, but they want to remain in control. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was murdered for opposing Hitler, said, Jesus did not go to the cross to ornament or embellish our life. If we wish to have him, then he demands the right to say something decisive about our entire life. And so obedience to God actually impacts how we spend our money, how our relationships, how we speak to our friends. It impacts our career. It dictates what we choose to do on a Sunday. And there are some super uncomfortable verses here from verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who, who talks the talk, who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. Many people will pros prophesy, do miracles, and call Jesus Lord, and Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Ouch, that's harsh. He's saying it's not enough to say that we're Christians. I suppose you could say a sort of talk is cheap if the lives that we live contradict this or don't confirm this to be the case. And so obedience is about putting the words of Jesus into action. The book of um, James is kind of his take on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says it's one thing to hear a sermon and to take communion and um, to sing songs, but then if you just walk out the door and forget everything that's been said and change nothing in your life, we've kind of missed the point. It's like looking at yourself intently in a mirror and then walking away and just forgetting what you've just seen. Jesus uses this illustration of two builders. Both builders wanted to build a house. One chose to build his house on a rock. The other chose to build his house on sand. And we can assume that there was no difference at all in the construction or the materials of either house. And it wasn't that one builder was more experienced than the other. The only difference between these two houses were the foundations that they were built upon. And what both, both houses experienced storms, but what determined, uh, what, uh, whether, what determined whether the house remained standing uh, was, a, was the, the foundation. And the foundation doesn't consist in believing in Jesus or saying that we agree with all the stuff that we hear. It, hearing is not enough, and neither are good intentions. The foundation is the direct result of putting it into practice. It's the result of hearing those words and building our lives upon them. So I want to say something about how we do this and what this looks like and why we might do this. So firstly, how. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. He is not looking for perfection or the finished article. He's looking for us to try, to initiate, to attempt. He wants faithfulness and not success. He wants us to choose to or to be willing uh, to trust him. He doesn't want heroics. It's about a kind of simple um, act of, of obedience each day. And it's a process. It's 
lifelong learning, building our foundation on God and Jesus is about putting in habits and uh, routines in place that strengthen and build our faith. It's about a consistency. And the kind of Jesus, uh, obedience that Jesus is talking about comes from a relationship. I don't know about you, but it uh, often comes with another context. But, you know, when somebody suggests that I ought to do something or that I should do something or that I'm obliged to do something, I kind of feel forced into it. And the joy of doing it out of my own volition and my own choice just kind of goes out the window. I, I can resent things that I have to do or I feel obliged to do. But that's not what God wants for our relationship with him. When we abide in God and God abides in us, when we stay connected to him, when we choose him over other things, when we spend time alone with God in prayer or reading or in silence, that sort of stirs up within us, that desire to obey him. And so what Jesus is talking about is is obeying from a place of relationship, not obligation, not out of fear of consequences, not out of duty. And that doesn't mean that we just follow him when we feel like it, but it means that the source of our obedience uh, is knowing that we are loved by him and loving him back. And to use the kind of picture from John about the vine and the branches, that, that's the sap uh, you know, that enables the branch to stay connected to the vine. Now, you might be wondering, well, okay, well, what, what does this look like on Monday morning? When we're in a relationship with God and um, we're communicating with him, his spirit is within us, helping, helping us and deepening that bond of love between us and God. And it's why the Holy Spirit is crucial to our faith. The Holy Spirit helps us to connect uh, what we hear with what we do. The Holy Spirit helps us to put G- what Jesus says into practice. And I've kind of just sort of described it as, as heard it being described as a kind of heavenly nudge. It's like tiny moments every day of obedience. Maybe you'll pray in the shower as you get up, asking God's spirit to work in you and through you that day. And then you walk to work and a friend comes to mind, like Chris described the other week, and there's a kind of heavenly nudge. Why don't you text your friend and and, and see how they are and encourage them? Maybe you're given some money and you pray about it and an idea just drops into your head uh, and kind of heaven nudges you again, you know, that you might want to spend your money differently or you might want to, there might be somebody else or something else that needs that money more than you. Or you might uh, be aware that you've crossed a line or that you've said something hurtful and there's a kind of heavenly nudge to go and apologize and to make things right with somebody. These smaller daily acts of obedience enable us to do the bigger stuff that God asks And that obedience brings about good fruit in our lives. It reinforces that kind of close connection with God. But it also brings us and others blessing. And that leads me on to why should we obey? Well, Jesus obeyed God by submitting to the authorities that chose to kill him. In Philippians, it says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He gave himself up to others. He obeyed his father in order that we might be saved and come into a relationship with him. So there is blessing in obedience. It means that the storms of life don't topple us and don't destroy us. Noah uh, obeyed God's instructions in the Bible. He built a boat and it saved his life. But Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they had to leave the Garden of Eden and suffer the consequences. There's another great example in in the Gospels. Jesus is at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he wants to use a boat to teach from because he's being crowded off um, the shore. And he says to Peter, can I use your boat? And at the end, Jesus says, go out there where it's deeper um, and let down your nets. And Peter's like, we've just worked all night and we didn't catch anything at all. But if you say so, uh, we'll try again. He does what Jesus asks him to do and catches so much fish that they, their, knit, their nets begin to tear. Obedience brings about blessing. Many of you know that we've made a decision recently to move the congregation from St. Faith's up to St. Paul's, and we're thinking we're doing that on the 16th of January. Uh, on that day, we'll have a last service at St. Faith's, and then from that week ahead, they'll be joining us here at St. Paul's. Now, we're closing Sunday services at St. Faith's, um, not because we want to, certainly not because it's been the easiest decision. 
um, but because we really feel like God is asking us to do this. And therefore, our response is one of obedience to what we think God is telling us to do, despite the fact that it's painful and it's difficult and not what we'd really like to do. What we do know from the Bible is that God blesses and rewards obedience. And I'm looking forward to seeing the fruit of that obedience and the blessing from it uh, in the coming year. Actually, at one point, I was worried about what would happen to us if we didn't obey God. So I want to leave you with an image this morning that might help us to understand obedience and its importance to our faith. And I want you to think about the, your, uh, the fact that you're a pilot flying a plane. At any one time, there are about 10,000 planes in the air, and they're carrying about 1.5 million people. Now, a pilot can't see the horizon outside of the aircraft, maybe because it's cloudy or rain or just because it's dark. He, the pilot has a GPS that helps them to navigate to the direction, destination that they're going to, and the pilot has technology to make sure it doesn't kind of collide with other planes uh, mid-air. And of course, if they ignore this guidance, then it'll be a fatal accident. So the pilot has some information on board the plane to help them fly, but to land the plane, they need to follow the ins exact instructions and the timing of the air controller at the airport because the air controller at the airport sees the whole picture, all the planes in the air and where they are, and they coordinate the landing and the takeoff of all the planes. They direct the pilots so that they take off and they land correctly, and they manage the whole sequence of events. God is like the air traffic controller, and we're the pilots of those planes. And as we respond to sort of heavenly nudges and we begin to put his words into practice and obey him, we participate in God's kingdom while he oversees and coordinates the bigger picture. But this only works if we as pilots obey him and do what he says. When we do what he says, he's able to coordinate or weave events together to bring about wholeness and healing and fruitfulness and blessing. But if we're pilots that never take off and just never get around to it, put it off for another day, I'll explore faith another time. Perhaps you watch others do it but don't really want to do it for yourself because you're a bit fearful, you're not sure how it's going to go. It's the equivalent of hearing all of these words of Jesus and not putting them into action. It's like watching YouTube videos uh, of flying or spending time in a simulator, but never actually doing it for yourself. Jesus clearly says in these passages that, that they're his words, not mine, that true disciples um, are the pilots who put his teaching into practice and who get off the ground. They fly and they participate in this life of faith, but from a place of relationship and connection with God, with the traffic controller. The more they fly, the more that they realize that this traffic controller knows what he's doing. And the easier it becomes for them to trust and obey the prompting and the heavenly nudges from their father in heaven. So I just wonder, using that analogy, where you see yourself in this picture. Are you a pilot in the air or are you grounded? Are you an observer or are you a participant and is Jesus Lord of every part of your life? Or are there parts of him where you really don't want him to be Lord? Let's pray. Let's just begin, though, with some silence as we think about this. Jesus calls us to obedience, to getting off the ground, to flying that plane, to to putting these things into practice, to building a, a life that can sustain us when storms hit us through rhythms and practices and prayer and all of those uh, things. He calls us to obedience, but then promises that there is a blessing in the obedience when we follow him. Lord Jesus, would you speak to each one of us now? 
help us, help some of us this morning, Lord, to get off the ground, to, to choose to obey, to choose to put these things into practice, to choose you over other activities and things, to pursue you, seeking your blessing, seeking life, knowing that your ways work for us. And Lord, for others who obey you, but not in every area of our lives, Father, would you help us to trust you with every part of our life? Would you help us to surrender and submit every aspect of our life to you? Knowing that you're a good Father, that you love us, and that you work with us to heal us, to bring us blessing and a close connection with you. As we sing this song now, I invite you just to stand and allow the Holy Spirit just to minister to you and just speak those words of intimacy to God, imagining that he's just standing next to you right now and he wants to hear from you. Speak to him. Tell him what you want. Tell him what you hope for. Ask him for his help. Offer him every aspect of your life. And invite his Holy Spirit into you more fully to enable you to participate in that life of faith. Holy Spirit, come now, we pray. Let's sing together.